This message, uh, or Bible study, as it were, um, comes as a result of, uh, of thinking uh, with regard to, to things over the past um, uh, several years, as I think back on life and, and ministry as it has been a part of the grace movement, uh, but especially as a result of going up to um, one of our favorite spots, uh, to, to a pastor's conference uh, on Friday. And the reason that I say that somewhat sarcastically is not because I do not enjoy the fellowship with some of the men uh, and uh, some of the things that we plan for as a region uh, to promote the grace message. But um, as you know, there are those who have uh, at this point entered our region and uh, entered the organization that have uh, contrary thinking contrary doctrines with regard to salvation, this matter of predestination and election. Uh, so much so that um, actually we were supposed to have a fall conference, uh, and, and uh, uh, this gentleman said that he does not want any pastor of our region uh, presenting a message at the fall conference unless they believe hyper-Calvinism. Well, right away, of course, um, my blood pressure rose just a smidgen. Uh, and uh, I immediately uh, began to plot and plan my answers, what, what's going on. Well, there, were there was talk amongst other brethren. And finally, after we broke for lunch there, somebody talked with him and he recanted. But the upshot of it is, is we can uh, preach on the riches of uh, Christ, the riches of God's grace, but we cannot use the word or the phrase whosoever will. Because when immediately when you say whosoever will, that means that God's gospel goes out for all. But see a hyper-Calvinist, those that are of the covenant persuasion, reform theology and the like, and I don't know what reform theology uh, is doing in dispensational circles. I've not, but there it's creeping in. As I've told you, it's creeping in everywhere. And uh, so this was uh, the, uh, the upshot. It was left with, well, okay, well, we can have it and we can all speak, but you cannot say whosoever will. Now, Paul says that many times, and uh, the, the verse was quoted by one of the men there, well, what about Paul in Romans chapter 10, verse 13, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Well, it doesn't mean what it says. So there, there you go. You're off to the races again. And often as I thought back, I, you know, you just wonder sometimes about, is it even worth it? I mean, today the mindset is don't stand for the truth. Don't tell the truth to make any distinction amongst believers. Let's just love one another, get along. You know, who cares about doctrine? It does not matter. And of course, it would be easy to do that. Um, after all, you look out in the, the world circles and those that don't tell the truth or make an issue of doctrine making the big bucks. They're having the big churches. They have, you know, everything that the, the world has going for them. They attract the big crowds and, and so forth. And, uh, and I thought back on, on, uh, on my life whenever uh, I took a stand being an independent Baptist. I remember that. And uh, I saw the grace message in the midst of a Baptist camp. It was um, the River Valley Ranch uh, north of Baltimore. And of course, um, Lee Hamoki's dad, Nevada Steve, went there and, and uh, he knew that I had just come from Lee's and I was reading all sorts of books that this heretic Lee had, had given him, had, had given me. And uh, I called Lee and said, I've seen the word rightly divided and I happened to mention it to, to Nevada Steve. And Nevada Steve told Uncle John, who is Uncle John. Uncle John was the brother of Uncle Peter, who was the pastor of one of the biggest Baptist churches there in uh, North Baltimore. I mean, it's a massive thing. And they were the ones that basically funded the River Valley Ranch. And Uncle John says, tell Denny if he believes that he's not welcome back here. I started my motor home and I left never to return to the River Valley Ranch, all because I took a stand for the grace message. Now, of course, uh, you have to understand that um, 
when, uh, you know, in those uh, circles, they all have their their meetings and they all are, are intertwined and we all know one another and so forth. And the word spread like a wildfire, uh, as it were. And uh, all of a sudden, a, a an evangelist, a young evangelist up and coming, who had his future ahead of him, uh, who was having anywhere from 40 to 45 weeks of meetings a year, you know, uh, was cut down to where I didn't get any mail at all. <laughs> you know, it wasn't a short time. Why? Well, because uh, they didn't want me if I did not tow the party line. Uh, in other words, they would rather me tell a lie, which is what m most of them uh, uh, believe, except for the gospel. Uh, they would rather me tell a lie than stand for the truth. And yet they are, they are ones who pound the pulpit about taking a stand for the truth. Well, Keeping the faith at that point meant paying a price. And uh, the, the price uh, was, was difficult because, as I said, often down through the course of the ministry of grace, I've seen grace pastors, myself included, we, we were criticized for smaller churches, not having the big bu budgets, not having what the other uh, uh, group has. But it's all because we have stood for the Apostle Paul. And that, that makes it difficult. And then to take all of this stand and guff, as it were, uh, uh, to, to see things get less and less, to go to, a, to a, a pastor's meeting and have this type of heresy injected that you've got to take another stand. Now, I've thought in my own mind, now what in the world am I going to do if I go there and I preach? And my, the topic of my message is the unsearchable riches of Christ. But I'm not allowed to say whosoever will. And I ask myself the question, well, what is the unsearchable riches of Christ? I mean, well, what bearing does that have on my salvation or the salvation offered to the world? Well, the unsearchable riches of Christ is simply this, that God kept silent his program of grace to this point, and he now revealed it. And what is that? The grace of God has appeared to, that brings salvation has appeared to all men. <laughs> Whosoever will can be saved. So if I go there and I do not say that, now I could go and not say the word whosoever will, all right? But if I say all men can be saved, is that not synonymous? Is that not the very same thing? And will that not be interpreted that I am now being a rebel rouser <laughs> trying to cause this man problem in his own church? Because that's what he said. I don't want anybody saying that. You know, if you're going to come and say this, I don't want you to speak. Now, I'm assigned a topic, and what do I do? If I don't speak, I'm, I, uh, I will be frowned upon. And if I do speak, I'll have to compromise. And right from the start, I did not compromise. And, um, and it, is just, it is just an absolute burden and, and so forth. And I thought, well, you know, it would be easy just to give in. Because after all, basically, generally, who cares? The world is going to go on. Um, and uh, if, if grace pastors were crawl under a rock, does it matter? And uh, you get to thinking those sorts of things. And of course, that's, that's all of the flesh and of the devil and the, and the like. Of course it matters. But I got to thinking, where in the world is, is there a portion of Scripture to minister to my heart with regard to the stand that I've taken, the price that I've paid, and that I've seen others uh, pay for, for the faith. And I think of, of our friend here, Pete Allen. The minute Pete said, I've embraced the grace message, he was so happy. He, he, he graduated, uh, and we've, we've got similar degrees from similar schools and so forth, and I know how happy I was to see the grace message. And I'm talking, you know, you to quote the phrase, happy-go-lucky, he would, he would hate that phrase because, you know, at that, at that time he was also an extreme Calvinist. Uh, he wouldn't even let us use potluck for our suppers, if you'll recall. We, ch we changed it to a providential provision whatever it was. But he's since changed that as well. But he, he said, and you could see the light dawning upon him, how happy he was. And he thought, just as I thought, boy, I've got the answer to understanding the scripture. And I began to share this. And I found out real soon that others didn't share my enthusiasm or joy. And he found it out real soon, so much so uh, that they ended up booting him out of his church. 
Since that time, he's, he's found a, a Grace Church, but he is often asked the question. He scratches his head. You know, why is this? Well, uh, you just have to understand that we, uh, you've got to take a stand and keep the faith. Now, verse number six of Second uh, Timothy chapter four is, is where we're going to start. And uh, just simply as an introduction, we'll come back to this on, on part number two of our, of our paper, pages three and four, eventually. But I got to thinking, okay, now what about the Apostle Paul? Toward the last of his ministry, now mind you, all of us need to understand this. Simply because we're living in the dying days of the dispensation of grace. And there is going to be a massive defection from the faith, and we're seeing it now. And it's not going to be easy for anybody who stands for the truth. So what I'm saying here is not just for those poor pitiful ministers, you know, that tend often to, to feel sorry for taking a stand, uh, which we shouldn't. That's whining, that's crybaby business, we should not do that. But you do, you get weary sometimes. You just think you finally got to the region where everybody is, you know, at least believing many similar things and we can go with, without a struggle and bam, there it is, right back again uh, on the um, issue of extreme Calvinism. So I got to thinking, well, what about the Apostle Paul? He comes to the end of his ministry and he had worked in, in Tarsus, his hometown. He had worked all through Galatia. Of course, the book of Galatians there was written uh, to the Galatian churches. It was a, a cyclical letter as such. He had worked at Colossians and, and, and uh, uh, Colossae and, uh, uh, in the city of um, the Ephesians there. And he sent all of these letters. And at the end of his ministry, all the time that he put in, in Turkey and in those places with his missionary journeys, he finally says, all that be in Asia have forsaken me. Well, that's, that's difficult. You imagine the man put his life's work into those churches and generally speaking, per se, in other words, is what he's referring to. Everyone there has forsaken the Pauline doctrine. They've gone off into other things, Gnosticism, legalism, Judaism, and so forth. In this um, a portion, it says in verse number 10, Demas has forsaken me. Uh, it says in verse number uh, 14, Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. Uh, notwithstanding, verse number 17, the Lord stood with me. Why does he say that? Verse 16, at my first answer, no man stood with me, but all men forsook me. Now, those are difficult things for a man who probably, in my estimation, was the second greatest person in all of the Bible. Jesus Christ, of course, is in a class by himself. Moses is almost that way. But I believe the Apostle Paul exceeded even Moses to the uh, uh, extent that he, that he served the Lord and, and so forth and took a stand for the Lord. So I then started thinking about especially as I was driving home from this meeting, what Paul says in chapter 4, verse 6, For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. Now what is he saying? I'm about to be executed. <laughs> Life is about to be over for me. Okay, now what is he going to say? What, what of all things could this man say? I built a super church. We didn't do that. Everybody forsook him. Uh, you know, uh, I had this and I had that and I had the other with regard uh, to the ministry. And he, and he did. He had an itinerant ministry and probably the only person who has spoken to more people, uh, and that's by way of technology, is, is Billy Graham or some of the ones uh, um, that, that broadcast today around the world. But Paul didn't have those things, and yet he said by toward the end of his ministry that all the world was evangelized. By whom? By him. <laughs> he was a zealous evangelist and apostle for Jesus Christ. 
But what does he say at the end that can mean something for us who are at the end, uh, basically? He says three phrases here. I have fought a good fight. Now, I'm not talking about the Frazier Ali type deal <laughs> because, you know, I've seen I've seen them uh, fight some pretty good fights, uh, fights that I enjoyed. You know, those guys that were in there. They meant business. They weren't going to be paid off, bribed, take a dive or what have you. They were good fights. They wanted the prize at, at the end. But the fight that Paul is referring to here is the fight for good, you see. I fought a good fight in the sense that at the end of my ministry, I have produced divine good in my life. The, the good fight is a reference to the struggle that we all have to think correctly. Because after all, that's what we're fighting for. We're, we're not fighting for the United States of America. We, our soldiers have been called on to do that for us, and that's fine in that sense. But what we technically and actually are fighting for is truth. If we do not have the truth at the end of our, of our ministries, our fight has not been a good fight, you see. It's been a bad one. We have struggled for error. Can you imagine? Uh, coming up, now Paul gave his life, and he said, I fought a good fight. Can you imagine those who heard the truth of Paul coming to the end of their life, and what can they say? Well, uh, I fought a fight, but the result of my life, my ministry, my influence has been falsehood. I've led other people astray. As he talks about Timothy, some... Um, causing the shipwreck of the faith of others who concerning the truth have erred, saying the resurrection is past and overthrew the faith of others. Can you imagine these men who have given their lives to this point and say, yes, I struggled, but I struggled against the Lord. I fought for the wrong thing. I don't know about you, but that gives me comfort. The second thing is, I have finished my course. We learned uh, this morning that we are all in a race. And I believe the men that uh, ran the race uh, were from Kenya, I think. Uh, and the guy ran 12 kilometers, as it were, what, 32 minutes? I <laughs> don't but some, some blinding speed uh, like that. Uh, remember the television show they used to have called The Flash where that guy just went like, well, you know, that's pretty quick. Uh, we, we couldn't probably go a half a mile in 32 minutes. I don't know at uh, that speed. But what did he do? He started, he kept up the pace, and he finished the course. Now, of course, when he talked to the Ephesian elders, he said it was the ministry that he got uh, from the Lord Jesus Christ to do what? To proclaim the gospel of the grace of God that he did not hesitate to, to give of himself because it was Jesus Christ himself who gave the, the ministry. In other words, he finished what he was commissioned to do. He finished what he started to do. Now, um, all, of, all of my life, going all the way back to my mom and uh, dad's, I, I've been one who has procrastinated especially when it's come to mowing the grass. Man, a lot. I hated to mow the grass. Even when I was unsaved, I recognized that the grass represented the curse on the earth. And that if I mowed that grass and made it look nice, I was somehow helping the world and the flesh and the devil, you know, uh, promote evil. But uh, I, I never, I was, I was always gonna do it. I'd always start off to do it. I'd always put oil and gas in the, in the mower. I'd always crank her up and get half of it done. And I'd always say, well, but there's a ball game. Yeah, well, but the guys are down at the Dairy Queen. Well, yeah, but, and uh, you know, I never finished what I started off to do. Thankfully, things have changed. <laughs> well, we don't want any lightning. <laughs> you know, I, I've gotten far better because I see the principle of finishing the course. I want to get where, by the end of my life, 
where God would have me be. That's what Paul is saying here. There is an objective to, to this fighting. And then the last thing, it is especially helpful, and that's what our study is. I have kept the faith. Now, what we're talking about and what we will be talking about over the course of the, the next few sessions will be keeping the faith. And it's, it's not what the world um, says or interprets with regard to this thing of keep the faith. You know, you're in a foxhole, the enemy's all around you, you, you get depressed, you want to give up and yield and surrender, and somebody yells, keep the faith. Now, what do they mean by that? Uh, Go to, go to Bible college and, uh, and no, they don't mean by that. What they mean by that is that keep having good thoughts. Keep, uh, keep the shiny side up, you know. Uh, everything's going to turn all right. Just keep believing that luck or fate or something is going to happen that's going to rescue you, you from these dire circumstances. It is nothing more than positive thinking when somebody says, keep the faith. Now, the Apostle Paul did not mean that. And the reason that we know that is simply because there is a definite article in front of the word, word faith in the Greek language. Now it's reflected here in the English, sometimes it, it, it's not. But the faith means something specific, and we'll note that in, in just a little bit. Turn, oh, to, before you turn there, look at the first part of verse number 8, because of this. These three statements are the basis of a special reward. Henceforth. Now, what is that word henceforth there for? It is there because it is a reference back to verse 7. Because I've done this, fought the good fight, finished my course, and because I've kept the faith, there is now a crown of righteousness. What is the basis of the special reward? It is keeping the faith. Who gets a crown of righteousness? Those who keep the faith. That is the thing, those who keep it. And that's why we get the crown of righteousness. Uh, everybody who is laboring in religion, religiosity, churchianity, everybody who, who goes uh, uh, to uh, church and so forth, it, it, it's, that's not the important thing. The important thing is at the end of your ministry, you did it as God said to do. That's when you get the crown of righteousness. And what is righteousness? We've looked at crowns in the Bible where uh, the high priest has holiness to the Lord. That means integrity or right thinking. And, and he would enter the presence of the Lord with this on his forehead, this mitre or crown that represented right thinking. We saw the crown on the false prophet who would have tattooed 666 and then over it, the, the, um, the mitre of the high priest, which shows, uh, which shows inconsistency, hypocrisy, holiness to the Lord when underneath he's worshiping a, a false god. We saw the crown on the head of the harlot, mystery Babylon, abominations of the earth. All of those crowns reflect a system of thinking, a philosophy, a way of life, or a a body of truth that is believed or embraced. Paul says, the faith, and the definite article, as we will see, designates the one and only faith. It can't be different than the faith Paul gave. We're dispensationalists. Man is judged in relation to the current revelation God gave. Just like Adam in the garden, Noah with the ark, Noah with the Noahic covenant, Abraham with the Abrahamic covenant, Moses with the law, Paul with grace. Everybody who lived in those historic eras and periods were responsible to live up to maintain, believe and promote what God had given. And that's what Paul said. I've kept it. Henceforth, there's a crown of righteousness. The reward of the crown of righteousness or right thinking is given to those who keep on fighting for the truth, finishing the course, having uh, 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 done what God said, and at the end saying, I've kept it intact, not added to or taken from. There's no admixture. It is what? It is the original faith that Christ revealed. Now, let's go from this to the second uh, uh, 
point here in our study. The importance of syntax in the study of the Bible. Now, what is syntax? I've just bought a yacht and perfume for $5,000 an ounce, <laughs> and I have to pay <laughs> what they call a syntax. <laughs> Listen, if you can pay for, for perfume that costs $5,000 an ounce, you, you need a, a syntax, as you've said. No, I'm just teasing. If you can afford it and that's what you want, have at it. But um, a syntax is not a tax on luxury. The syntax I'm talking about is the science of studying word arrangement. Now, how does that have a bearing immediately? What illustration can I give immediately uh, on, on understanding what we're talking about? If there was no definite article in front of faith, it makes the word faith in the verse that we read subjective. Uh, whose faith? What faith? Or generally, faith. Keep the faith. It's the Catholic faith. It's the Mormon faith. No definite article. But syntax demands that as soon as you put the definite article, it makes it something specific. It, it, is, it is the faith, or as, uh, as it demands, the one and only faith. And that's what the word arrangement has, or the sentence structure. It can influence the meaning of other words. Now, we're really going to see this because what I'm going to do is from here on have an exegesis of a portion of Scripture. Acts chapter 13. Acts chapter 13. Now, we're about out of time in, in this session, but we do have a few moments. And so I'm going to um, relate to you some things that, ha that have been said, some basic beliefs of extreme Calvinists. And I'm going to take you here to verse number 48 because it is a proof text. It is a text, they say, that uh, shows beyond a shadow of a doubt that our insistence that man believe is a false teaching. And of course, uh, um, there were terms bandied about like, well, you know, I, I'm the heretic of the region, just ask Denny. <laughs> and my tongue bled. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> could have had communion with literal blood there because I, oh, a bit, a bit, a bit. I couldn't eat my food. I had to gargle with salt water to coagulate, you know. I didn't, I did not state a word. Why ask me, you know, I, because the last time there was such a furor and, uh, and it was caused by me. And so I went to the next meeting and this guy didn't show up. And so I asked the board generally, I said, look, if you guys think that I'm a heretic, I want a little explanation here because here's what the, the, the um, GGF doctrinal statement says. We believe in the total depravity of man. And I said, amen, we believe that. But we believe that God in grace acts on behalf of man to give man the enlightenment and enablement to choose for himself subsequent to the fall of Adam. Because of the cross of Jesus Christ, this is the gospel or good news. God gave man a, a second chance. That's what it is. Oh, but no, you can't say all men, just certain men, because he has picked them to be said. Oh, man, you get so tired of it. He has concluded all in unbelief that he might have what? Mercy upon all. The same amount that he concluded in unbelief, which was every man, is the same amount that he gave mercy to. And mercy means that he, he, he is, he is a, not giving us what we do deserve, but in grace he is giving us the enablement to rectify our fallen state in Adam. And uh, I'm, I'm going to take a stand for Biblicism, that the sovereign will of God and the free will of man coexist in Scripture. 
and uh, we'll discuss the doctrine of the pre-resolution. I better not get into that because between Sunday school and church, I'll have to be drawing some new <laughs> things like I did before. I don't know about you, but I like that car illustration where the parents provide the car and say, okay, fine, I will keep that car in existence for you, but now here is your responsibility. If you want to keep it in pristine condition uh, and, and so forth, then that's what you have to do. And so there is responsibility on both parts. But let's read verse number 48. Now this is a verse that was read Friday. And when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord. And as many as were ordained to eternal life believed. Uh-oh. Well, pastor, wait one second. You're the one always telling us you have to believe the Bible of face value. Yes, that's true. But I will also be the first one to admit that you have to go back to the original language and understand syntax, hermeneutics, the science of understanding language, what goes where, and how you determine precisely what is, what is said. Now, uh, hold your place here and come back with me to Daniel chapter 9. Daniel chapter 9. And we'll read verse number 26, start, starting there. And show you the importance of syntax, which simply means that the word order in the original languages, of course, syntax is for every language. You have to have the right word order in order for you to understand what is precisely being said. So, Verse number 26, and after three score and two weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. And the end thereof shall be with a flood unto the uh, end of the way. Desolations are determined. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. Okay, now we have there an indefinite masculine pronoun. He. Now we've had dispensationalists to come and take that verse of scripture, lift it right out of its context, and say that the he there is the king of the north. <laughs> the, the, the he there is the king of Syria, or the king of Russia, and so forth. And you get to thinking, well, man alive, well, then they would say, well, th this, is a, this is an educated guess uh, because uh, we've studied all, all this long. One thing they didn't study was syntax and hermeneutics. Because if they did, they would have learned the principle that, that, that governs the understanding of who he is. And that is the, the uh, principle of precedence. In the context, the Word of God will, whether the immediate or far context, the Word of God will always give a precedent, an antecedent, which will determine absolutely uh, what is being referred to or who is being referred to. All right? If we simply back up to the nearest reference to a man... And we, we know he's a man because he's the prince that shall come. He's not the princess that shall come. The Antichrist is not a she, it is a he. All right? Which, by the way, is another good, good thing. That syntax or grammar or word arrangement and, and the way that it is designated as it is in Scripture. Therefore, when we say God our Father or He is God... It is unthinkable to change that to our father, mother, God, because it's not cheap. By the way, some churches are doing that. I don't know if you know that. They're making genderless hymn books and genderless scriptures so that if it is a he in scripture, they'll just refer to it, it to it, it is God or a, mo a father, mother, God or something of that nature. And of course, they corrupt the, the truth. Who is the he referring to here? going back in the context to the antecedent. In the middle of verse 26, 
the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Okay, now just a couple things here with regard to syntax that we can, we can learn. First of all, the he of verse number 27 is the prince that shall come of verse number 26. That's who it's referring to. It cannot be anybody else. Syntax and grammar demands that that's how it be interpreted. The second thing about it is that it cannot be the king of Syria and it cannot be the king of Russia because the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Who were the people that destroyed it? The Romans. Therefore, the prince is going to rule over what geographical location? The revived Roman Empire. Simple as that. Uh, how did you determine this? Simply by syntax and grammar, honoring the laws of language. The, 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 you know, God, this book is a supernatural book, but God did not <laughs> somehow concoct a new way of speaking just so to speak to our hearts. He kept it so that we all could understand it if we keep these laws. Okay. Let's go back to, oh, I'm uh, almost out of time. Let's go back to verse number 48 and we'll, we'll stop. We are out of time. Well, how do you answer then? And as many as were ordained to eternal life believed. We will answer this plainly and simply by going through every word and honoring the word arrangement or the sentence structure. If you do that, you'll find out that the Greek says something totally different than what the people of the King James English um, uh, determined to translate.